Hello, and welcome to the Mystery Barn Podcast. I'm Heather, and thank you for joining me today as we take a look at our next case. This episode contains some discussion of a mature nature, so it may not be suitable for listeners of a young age. Please use your discretion. You can listen and follow this podcast on Spotify, Apple, Audible, Google, Stitcher, and several other podcast platforms. You can also follow me on Twitter at Mystery Barn Pod, or reach out to me at mysterybarnpodcast at gmail.com. With that out of the way, let's get started. The date is June 13, 1994. The place is San Antonio, Texas, and our story is about 13-year-old, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Nicholas Barclay. That morning, his mother, Beverly Dollarhide, had given him five dollars and they spoke about him going to play basketball in the afternoon. She told him to be home by dinner. After enjoying some time playing basketball with his friends, Nicholas calls home to see if his mother can come pick him up. His older brother Jason, who was living with them at the time, answered the phone. Their mother worked nights at a local convenience store and was sleeping at the time the call was made. The basketball courts were a mile or two away from their home, and Jason did not want to wake her, so he told Nicholas to walk home. He would never be seen or heard from again. That is, until more than three years later, when something so unexplained and bizarre happens, something so unpredictable and shocking that the family is thrown into yet more heartbreak when it all comes to light and truths are revealed. Before we get into that, let's talk a bit about who Nicholas is and his life before the fateful day in June. Nicholas was born on December 31, 1980. He was raised by a single mom and had two siblings that were quite a bit older than him, Carrie and Jason. Life was difficult for Nicholas, and he was frequently truant. He reportedly had many run-ins with the police. His mom stated that he sometimes would strike her and yell. The police were frequently called to the residence. In an attempt to help give Nicholas some stability and his mother some help, his older brother Jason agreed to live in the house with them. I believe that Jason was in his 20s at the time. When he did attend school, he was often in trouble. Even at a young age, he already had a juvenile criminal record for breaking and entering, theft, and truancy. On June 14th, the day following his disappearance, he was scheduled to appear for a sentencing hearing. The hearing would also discuss the possibility of Nicholas being sent to a juvenile home for delinquents, something he was quite opposed to. Although he was only 13 at the time of his disappearance, his mother would describe him as being hard to discipline. He could be violent, knew his way around the streets, or thought he did, and had run away from home several times in the past. I read somewhere that said that he even had three tattoos by the time of his disappearance. So when Nicholas failed to return home after his basketball game with friends, it is understandable that the alarms weren't raised right away. He was a frequent runaway, and he did have a hearing scheduled for the next day that he likely wanted to avoid. When he was reported missing, it was initially assumed that he had just run away again, as he had in the past. There didn't seem to be any big fuss made, and even the police assumed that he would return within a few days on his own, as he had previously done in the past. But as the days and weeks went by without a word or clue as to where Nicholas was, it became more ominous. There had been no leads, no information, and no sightings. It was like Nicholas had just simply vanished. Just over three months from his last sighting, police would receive a call from Jason, the older brother, thought he had just seen Nicholas trying to break into the family's garage. He told the police that he had fled as soon as he saw that Jason had spotted him. Police arrived at the home and searched the area and neighborhood for him, but nothing came of it. Police were unable to confirm that there were any signs of a break-in or that Nicholas had actually been there, so it was not considered to be a valid sighting. The days and the months would quickly turn into years without a single clue or sighting, and the family was no closer to knowing what became of Nicholas. Disheartened, they began to slowly accept that he had possibly become the victim of foul play. All sorts of scenarios would play out in their heads, I'm sure. Did he hitchhike and get into a car where someone caused him harm? Was he abducted? All these questions and more were sure to play through their heads, and as time went by, they had started fearing the worst. Then, miraculously, three years and four months after his disappearance, in October of 1997, police would receive a phone call that would pull the rug out from everyone. Nicholas had been found. The caller told police that they were there as tourists in Linares, Spain, 
and were calling because they had found a child. The caller stated that he had been found alone, lost, and scared, and he believed that he had been a victim of abuse. The police arrive at the location and find a teenager huddled, scared, and not willing to really communicate with them. He is brought to the police station and is then placed into a youth home. The family was overjoyed, and his older sister Carrie rushed to Spain to bring Nicholas back home. When she arrived in Spain, the reunion was a bit tense. She noticed behavior changes in Nicholas, but attributed that to all of the horrific events that he must have gone through over the past few years. He wore a lot of clothes and kept covered up. He was nervous and really did not talk very much. He seemed much different than the brother she knew, but knew that he had been through unspeakable horrors. She had brought with her many family pictures and spent considerable time with Nicholas talking about family members and memories. She ultimately identifies him as her brother, and the two return home to an anxiously awaiting family. When the two arrive back into the United States, the rest of the family is overjoyed to be reunited with their missing family member. While the Nicholas they had known was outgoing and boisterous, this Nicholas was very guarded and quiet. He seemed very reserved and barely spoke, and when he did speak, it was very quietly, sometimes even at a whisper. His family struggled with this, but they also kept in mind that he had been through a horrible experience and was very likely traumatized from everything he had been subjected to. According to Nicholas, he would tell them that he had been abducted, beaten, raped, and forced to endure punishments. He would be punished for speaking English, and he was forced to speak French. He was subjected to experiments, and one such punishment involved placing drops into his eyes that resulted in them changing from blue to brown. He received much sympathy from those around him, and they started to adjust to the new Nicholas. One reunion that struck me as odd was with his brother Jason. I don't believe he was part of the initial welcome group, and when he did finally come around to see Nicholas, he was rather reserved and didn't really respond to him as a brother. His words to Nicholas were, good luck, before leaving. Over time, Nicholas started to adjust and settle back into life in San Antonio, Texas. He returned to school, entering high school. He started to live the life of a regular teenager, making new friends, even developing a crush or two on girls. They never forced him into speaking with them about what had happened. They felt that he would open up once he was comfortable and ready. By November of 1997, the Center for Missing and Exploited Children reached out to the family as they had not received any contact from Barclay's family. They felt that it was imperative to do an interview as quickly as possible for them to try to get behind what had happened and look for the abductors. At the initial meeting, investigators are puzzled by the boy. He didn't appear to resemble Nicholas at all. The investigator noted that he did not appear to be 16 and had a shadow of a beard that was very dark in color. Knowing that Nicholas was a blonde-haired child, she wondered how it was possible for this to be. She noted that he was very nervous and uncomfortable throughout the whole interview. Nicholas tells them that he was abducted by military in a van before being flown overseas and held captive in a location with other children. He spoke of the abductors being in military-style uniforms and of being moved around to different military base locations. He told them that the children, himself included, were subjected to molestation and rape on a regular basis. They were tortured, beaten, had bones broken, and experimented on. He spoke of horrific acts of torture. He described steps the abductors took to mask the identity of the children by subjecting them to experiments that changed their eye and hair colors. One day, a door had been carelessly left open, and Nicholas saw this as his chance to escape. He took this opportunity to keep running. He says that after some time, he realized that he was in Spain. Shortly thereafter is when the initial call to the police is made from the tourists that happened across the huddled and scared Nicholas. The investigator walks away from the interview shaken and saddened by the story that Nicholas told them. They assure the family that they will find the people responsible. They urge the family to not contact the media. They wanted to preserve the information that Nicholas had given them so as not to alert the kidnappers. If there was any truth to the story having military connections at any level, they didn't want the guilty parties tipped off. Understandably, journalists and the public wanted to know as much as they could about the story. Not only was he a child that had been missing for over three years, but he was one that had been missing and found in another country. Many questions were still unanswered. TV shows reached out for the interviews. One such show, Hard Copy, wanted to do an interview and enlisted the services of a private investigator named Charlie Parker to help them locate the boy and the family. They were able to locate them and secure an interview. During this interview, Charlie sat back at a vantage point while the interview was being conducted. 
He was seated at a booth, and behind the booth was a photo of a young Nicholas Barclay. He could see both the pitcher and Nicholas Barclay at the same time, and was stunned by how much he did not resemble the young boy. He noticed several physical characteristics that didn't seem to jive with the boy known as Nicholas Barclay. He had many reservations and suspicions. He felt like something was wrong. He couldn't let it go and asked if someone could get a picture of his ears. He had read about Scotland Yard and how they had used that method to locate the man responsible for killing Martin Luther King Jr. They caught him at Heathrow Airport after identifying him by his ears. Once Charlie Parker had the picture and returned home, he did a side-by-side -side comparison of the ears and discovered they did not match. His first instinct was that maybe he was possibly a spy. He contacts the FBI to discuss his findings. They are hesitant because of how much the family has accepted Nicholas into their home. They felt that for the family to be so accepting that this must be their son, despite all of these major differences. They warned Charlie about interfering with an FBI investigation. Meanwhile, the FBI is working diligently trying to find the people responsible for abducting Nicholas. They are having a very difficult time finding leads, as the details Nicholas had given them were not full of a lot of concrete information. They tell the family that they would like to take Nicholas to Houston to see a forensic expert to help Nicholas with the trauma of everything that he has been through. When they arrive at the Texas Children's Hospital, they meet with Dr. Bruce Perry. He had been preparing for an interview to help the FBI find out more information about the people who took Nicholas. However, at the start of the interview, when Nicholas spoke back to the doctor, warning signals started going off in the doctor's head. He has asked to repeat back all the stories and the doctor notices that he doesn't have a lot of physiological signs present that would normally be present when someone is speaking about such a traumatic experience. It was almost like he was reciting a script. He noted that he was unable to speak English without a French accent. He said that it was not possible for a kid raised in an American English-speaking family to not be able to speak like that. He concluded that this kid could not have been raised in an English-speaking family during his early developmental years. He felt that the person he was interviewing could not possibly be Nicholas Barclay. He expresses his concern to the FBI. The FBI reaches out to his sister Carrie and tells them of their concerns. She tells Carrie that the doctor that spoke with him felt that this could not possibly be their brother. They express concern that he was probably not even an American, and they start to ponder what this person's true intentions might be. They tell Carrie that they can keep him and that she did not have to meet them at the airport to take him home. She says okay. But upon arrival back into San Antonio, Carrie is waiting at the airport for them. She acts as though their conversation never took place. Also, at the same time as all of this was going on, Charlie Parker is still looking into things. He can't let it go, and he continues to investigate on his own. He reaches out to people who knew Nicholas before his disappearance to get a better idea of just who Nicholas and his family were. He finds that all of the stories describe a troubled child, repeated police visits, and descriptions of a boy who did not even come close to the Nicholas who had been returned to them. The FBI reaches out to his mother, Beverly Dollarhide, and requests a DNA sample. She is adamant about not wanting to go with the FBI and does not want to consent to a DNA sample. The FBI is understandably confused as to what is going on with his family. They start looking at things from different angles, even wondering if the family has something that they are trying to hide they know that something is not right. What started off as an investigation into trying to find out who kidnapped and abducted Nicholas is about to turn into something that no one saw coming. Because of the family's refusal to submit DNA samples, the FBI obtains a warrant to obtain these. They bring them into the office and take fingerprints and DNA samples. They hope that within a few weeks they will have the answers they are looking for. Charlie Parker starts to follow the family and takes notes of the comings and goings. Nicholas agrees to meet with Charlie. Over breakfast, he admits that Beverly is not his mother. At the same time, the FBI office gets a call from Spain saying that there is a match on the fingerprints. What Nicholas is about to reveal to Charlie and the FBI are about to have confirmed is his real identity. The boy who has been walking around as 16-year-old Nicholas Barclay is not Nicholas at all. He is 23-year-old Frederick Pierre Bourdain.
As reports started filing in, it becomes stunningly clear that Frederick Bourdain has a career of playing an imposter. He has several aliases and identities that he went by and an extensive criminal history, but this one was over the top. He literally faked the identity of a kidnapped boy and was able to not only convince the authorities early on, but also the very family of the missing boy. This brought back all of the feelings of sadness and heartbreak. I'm sure it was like losing their loved one all over again. Frederick Bourdain is forthcoming on what he has done, but he has yet another startling claim to make. Bourdain tells the San Antonio Police Department that Nicholas' family had killed the real Nicholas. Based on this revelation, a homicide investigation is opened. He alleges to the police that while he was living in their home, Beverly admitted to him that her and his brother Jason killed Nicholas and hid his body. Beverly agrees to take a polygraph test and passes it. The FBI investigator feels something is not correct and requests a second test be given. She passes the second test. Again, they are baffled, and yet a third test is administered. This results in her failing every part of it. She then becomes very hostile and adamant and agitated and left the location. She later states that she failed the test because of some of the questions that she answered wrong that had to do with another matter not related to Nicholas. Charlie Parker, meanwhile, is still doing investigating. He still can't shake the feeling that Nicholas was killed and the family had something to do with it. He gets permission from the people that own the house that Nicholas went missing from, and they agree to let him poke around and dig on the property. The investigators reach out to the only other person who was living in the home at the time of Nicholas's disappearance, his brother Jason. They found him in a drug rehabilitation center. They found him to be uncaring and not really even concerned with the whole situation. He expressed his doubts from the start about whether or not that was his brother when he first arrived back home. He was not very cooperative with them refused to help, and was hostile towards them. They would find out that he later leaves the rehabilitation center and ends up dying of a drug overdose not long after. Frederick Bourdain is convicted of perjury and fraudulently obtaining a passport. He is sentenced to six years in prison. Upon release from prison, he is returned to France, and astonishingly, he goes on to impersonate several more missing children. From what I read on Wiki, he does this until 2007, when he meets and marries a woman. They go on to have five children. He has run various cons and has many run-ins with the law. I will include some links in the show note if you are interested in looking into some of his crimes. I also highly recommend watching the movie entitled The Imposter, which chronicles the events of this deception and was a very good source of information for this podcast. As shocking and sensationalized as this missing person case has become, the key takeaway is that the real Nicholas Barclay is still missing. He has been missing since June 13, 1994. At the time of his disappearance, he was 13 years old, approximately 4 foot 8, and weighed about 80 pounds. He was last seen wearing a white t-shirt, purple pants, and black sneakers. He had a pink backpack with him. He was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. He is a Caucasian male with light brown blonde hair and blue eyes. He has three tattoos, the letter T on his left hand between his thumb and forefinger, the letter J on his left shoulder, and the letters L and N on the outer left ankle. He has a gap between his front teeth and goes by the nickname of Nicky. His birthday is December 31st, 1980, and he would be 40 years old today. If you have any information about his disappearance or anything that might be helpful to investigators and police, please reach out to the San Antonio Police Department at 1-210-207-7484. Again, that number is one 1- 210-207-7484 or contact 1-800-THE-LOST 1-800-843-5678 I thank you for joining me today on the Mystery Barn Podcast as we talk about the case of missing Nicholas Barclay. This has definitely been a roller coaster of a case. I'm your host Heather and if you have any comments or you just want to reach out with any theories or thoughts you may have you can contact me at mysterybarnpodcast at gmail.com or find me on Twitter at mysterybarnpod. Thank you, and we'll see you soon. Mm-hmm.